evening, everybody, and welcome to this evening's panel from Reimagine Nova Scotia. So tonight's topic is Create and Commemorate. So before we get started, I first want to, we first wish to recognize that Dalhousie University sits on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. We are all treaty people. So again, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Lori Turnbull. I am the director of the School of Public Policy, or sorry, Public Administration, got to wake up soon, at Dalhousie University, and um, welcome everybody tonight. And so we've got a really, really special panel tonight, so I'm not going to take up too much of your time at all. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the Reimagine project to kind of give the, tonight's panel a little bit of context, and then I'm going to turn it over to the panel members so that you can get right into it. So the Reimagine Nova Scotia project was something that started in conversations largely at the Faculty of Management at Dalhousie. We started thinking about how Nova Scotia has been through not only a pandemic, but also, um, you know, we've, we're having conversations that ev everybody's having on the legacies of colonialism and racism and how we can, we can move ahead better than we have before. But also at the same time, um, as all of this has been going on in, in the months of 2020, Nova Scotia has also had the largest mass shooting in Canadian history. And so I think it's fair to say that um, for those of us in this province, we have had compounding trauma. We have had a very unique experience and it's important, I think, for our rebuilding effort to really focus on what is unique about Nova Scotia. Everybody in the world is trying to figure out how to rebuild after COVID and we're not after COVID. We're still obviously moving through pretty frightening statistics in many parts of the country. And while Nova Scotia is, um, you know, has, has done such an amazing job of managing COVID on a public health level, and other jurisdictions have too, we can see levels of COVID rising. Uh, the public health crisis is becoming very acute. And so, you know, this is by no means to suggest that we're out of the woods on any of that. But obviously, we do have a very important conversation ahead of us over how we want to prioritize moving forward. We want things to be better than they have ever been. We want to be forward looking. We want to be solutions oriented. And we want to really do this together in a novel way. And so what we wanted to do with this project is think about the priorities for rebuilding. And so we came up with five. And this Create and Commemorate is, is the fifth panel. And so this is kind of the fifth topic that we're bringing you. And for each topic, we organized a cluster of people. And so not only were academics from Faculty of Management and Dalhousie more broadly involved, but also um, members of the community, members of the business community, many people in Nova Scotia who wouldn't necessarily always have been around the same tables, but we got them around the same, same tables this time to sort of bring some interesting heads together and think about how to move forward. And so we're very proud that the work is informed not just by scholarship, but also by experience and by practice. And so with that, I'd like to again, welcome everybody who is new to us, who has never come to a panel before, and also welcome everybody who has joined us before because it's it's great to have you back. So without taking up too much more time, I am going to introduce you to your four panel members who then are gonna keep you company for the next while. And I will say that we're gonna have a question and answer period at the end. So if you are listening to the panelists and you have a sense of something you wanna, you wanna ask at the end, there will be time for that. So first I'm gonna introduce you to Jacqueline Warwick. Jacqueline is the director of the Fountain School of Performing Arts here at Dalhousie University. Holly Matheson is the music director of Symphony Nova Scotia. So welcome Holly. Peter Dykeis, the director and curator for the Dalhousie Art Gallery. And Raisa Lalani, the artistic director of the Prismatic Art Festival. So I will turn it over to you all and thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Laurie. It's wonderful to reconnect with my group of panelists. We had such wonderful conversations um, through the summer with um, the three uh, co-collaborators that are with me here, um, and also other people in our group included uh, Martin Durier-Kopp, who is an academic Dean at uh, NASCAD, Kevin Lewis, a visual artist and film industry professional, uh, Brian Lilly, my colleague, a dancer and choreographer, Nathan Simmons, a wonderful local actor, Karen Spaulding, who is a performance presenter and owner of the Carlton, and the artistic director of Neptune Theatre. We had some terrific conversations through the summer, thinking about uh, the power of the arts to build connection and community. We all see a really important role for creative communities in reimagining Mi'kma'ki, uh, Nova Scotia. 
artists we feel can help to heal from trauma and art can support our efforts to hold on to empathy and humanity in this time of social distancing. We all recognize the ways that art can transform spaces, uh, spaces that have been harmed by colonialism uh, and create opportunities for inspiration and for creativity, but also for reconciliation and forgiveness. Um, before I uh, start speaking with my fellow panelists, I need to tell you all, I think it's important to acknowledge that I am not at home right now. Uh, the power went out at my house about 45 minutes before this panel was supposed to start. Uh, so I'm speaking to you from the home of my dear friends, uh, Jennifer Bain and Simon Docking. I feel like this is really actually emblematic of the way arts communities work, that uh, uh, Jennifer is my colleague in the Fountain School. Uh, Simon Docking is the artistic director of the Scotia Festival of Music. Um, and when I reached out to them and said, like, the power's gone out and I have to be online in 45 minutes, they uh, let me come over um, and, and just sort of turn things over to me. And I feel like this is really uh, a metaphor for the way that artists are resourceful. Uh, we're community minded. And in this community uh, in Nova Scotia, in this region, we really help each other. And there's such a strong sense of community uh, and, and everybody pitching in to, to get things done. So um, my great thanks to Jennifer and Simon. Uh, and, and I think this really is a, a fantastic emblem of the things that we're talking about. So in our conversations this summer, as we worked towards writing our report, we had many fantastic meetings and we asked ourselves four questions, which I'll repeat for you all now. We asked ourselves, what are the obligations and the challenges for artists, for creators, and for creative communities in Mi'kmaq today? What are the specific identities of creative communities in Nova Scotia that make us different from other Canadian communities and other creative communities in the international sphere? What is needed and what will be needed to support careers for artists and creatives, creators in this region? And finally, what role can Dalhousie play in supporting a vibrant arts culture uh, in this region? Uh, I've always felt I didn't grow up in this region, uh, but I always feel, and, and I know others agree with me, that Nova Scotia, we feel really punches above its weight uh, in terms of its contributions to the arts world. This is a region that truly values the arts. Um, music, theater, storytelling, visual arts are so central uh, to what makes life in Nova Scotia special. Uh, and, and so it's really fantastic to have had this opportunity to really think about what what are the ways that uh, arts communities in this region can help lead us forward uh, from this terrible uh, year? So I'm going to go around and ask all my panelists to uh, chime in and talk about some of the the ideas that we uh, that we discussed over the summer. So I'll ask um, Risa Lilani to answer my first question. Uh, we would like to talk about what is the current situation for artists in Nova Scotia? What do you see as challenges and opportunities for us? Thank you so much for the question. Um, I would just first like to acknowledge that I'm joining you all from Tukbuk in Mi'kmaq on the ancestral and unceded territories of the Mi'kmaq people. And for me personally, it is an honor to work, to live and to share in the lives of the cultural residents of Mi'kmaq. So kind of just to jump right in, um, one of the key factors that we identified at the beginning of our conversation when we started talking um, is identity. And the main thing that we need to think about moving forward um, is what is Nova Scotia's identity? So who makes up this province? And even on a national scale, what do we want people to think about when we are thinking about Nova Scotia? And you know, as mentioned in the intro, we do have a history of suppressing identities on this land, the indigenous people, the original caretakers of the land, African Nova Scotians, and the shift in acknowledgement of who we are and who we want to be can come and be shaped and informed by the art. Um, but this is a challenge that has been around for Indigenous artists and artists of colour for a very, very long time. And in fact, that actually is our story uh, at the Prismatic Arts Festival. So to give you a little bit of background of who we are um, and in relation to the challenges and how we can progress moving forward, Prismatic started in the back of a grocery store. Uh, our executive director, Shaheen Siadi, started a theater company um, because of the necessity and the need for a space to create, uh, to showcase work, to be an artist, and to be involved in the sector because there were not opportunities. Um, and this was just, you know, just a couple decades ago, there were barriers. Um, and so as the theater company grew, she recognized the need for other artists, Indigenous artists and artists of color locally and from across Canada who are also facing these barriers. 
and these obstacles. And in wanting to provide a main stage for these artists, uh, Prismatic was born. It started as a two hour program at Neptune Theatre. And from there, you know, the recognition from Indigenous artists and artists of color and the community and audiences, it kept growing. So in sharing that story with you, um, it's important for, for us to know and realize that artists tell their story. So for us at Prismatic, it was enabling them, uh, whether that was support through their creative processes or by providing a platform uh, to give opportunities so that they can perform and tell their stories. And I think that is what is going to shape the future identity of this province so that all voices are represented and all voices are heard. Mm -hmm. And in regards to art, art is cleaning space. Um, art is connecting and telling stories. And through art, we can see a shift in what our identity is so that there is representation from everyone who is there. So another thing that kind of came along with identity as we were speaking um, that has been a challenge that we move through opportunity is art and language. Language is inter intertwined with uh, the community um, and with identity. And the retention of one's language has been denied through colonialism in this region for a long time. And the importance of decolonizing stages and spaces and having languages and different ways of communication and art forms represented is of the utmost importance in respecting and shaping our future identity. So currently and through this pandemic, there has been shifts in conversations um, and political movements. And this is something that we acknowledged and we started creating. And I think now it's time to make space for artists, all artists, Together, we need to work together to support and create opportunities um, and shape a new identity for Nova Scotia through a positive medium like art. That's great, Raisa. Thanks so much. Um, Peter, I wonder if you'd like to add on to her remarks. Yes, I have a couple of uh, things to uh, speak to. And again, thank you so much, Raisa, for that very comprehensive you know, introduction about the issues. Uh, for me, being here on Mi'kma'ki as a settler is incredibly important. And one of the projects that I will talk to actually is directly relationship to that in terms of honoring and respecting the territory and the peoples that have been here for 14,000 years. So one of the challenges that I see is uh, really the duress that presentation venues in the performing arts are under due to social distancing limits uh, on audience size inside of buildings. Um, it's maybe a partial solution, but we in the visual arts um, don't have it quite so uh, tough right now because we can build social distancing into exhibition design and offer a safe space to both produce and or experience work. So it's important from my point of view then that we combine forces across creative practices and break down the silos and produce hybrid projects to solve mutual problems brought on by COVID and everything else. I uh, just want to share with you three examples that we're working on right now. Um, the Art Center right now is closed due to COVID, but as Jacqueline will know, it is also closed due to massive construction and renovations. So um, a number of months back, we realized we could do mutual service by storing on behalf of Mountain School of Performing Arts, all of their pianos, like seven grands and 23 uprights uh, in the gal gallery where it was climate controlled and secured during the renovations. So, um, I saw all these panels rolling into my space and go, this is an opportunity to exactly um, express what we're talking about in terms of working across platforms. So we're working on a one hour program uh, with seven Fountain School grand pianos and Fountain School musicians um, will perform on them. And this will all be in the next uh, couple of weeks captured professionally um, by videographers and sound engineers for public release as a broadcast program in uh, in January. And ironically, uh, Simon Docking, the host of Jack Jacqueline's <laughs> right now is one of the people involved with the project. So here we go. Um, another project, and this is where we go back to speaking about uh, Mi'kma'ki and just uh, the ancestral territory that's of importance. Um, about 
six years ago, there was talk about the development of what was going to be called the Bicentennial Plaza off of the Killam uh, Library area, which was donor walls and seating and just basically, you know, fancy furniture in the landscape. And Christine Macy, then uh, Dean of the School of Architecture and Planning, we went to senior administration and go like, uh, Dell's been around for like 200 years, what do you do? What about the fact of 14,000 years of uh, ancestral land for the Mi'kmaq people? And uh, that whole project then has been revisioned as the Bicentennial Commons and a small project that we're gonna be part of is just starting underway. So we're working with indigenous artists to design on campus, uh, outdoors, a pollinator garden, a butterfly garden. And this is based on the spirit of uh, other, uh, he's deceased now, uh, Mi'kmaq artist named uh, Mike McDonald. So we. This will be done with um, Dow's professional staff, uh, the White Grounds Creek Keepers, as well as we at the, at the university. But it's an important thing, again, to look at the sort of venues that are um, doable in a COVID environment, but also a much more public and hybrid uh, project. Um, third thing here is I wear a number of hats and one is co-founder of a small artist co-op on North Street named Hermes and during the last few months we've given our space to a couple of dancers to use it for choreographic study and practice just due to the lack of you know safe space so it's that sharing again as Jacqueline is demonstrating right now it's really really important. Uh, the second challenge and I'll be brief is um, one of the other hats that I've been wearing for the last six years, and this is under a topic called survival and resilience, is I've just spent, uh, finished six years of service on the Board of Arts Nova Scotia, the province's Arts Council, ending two weeks ago, uh, two-year uh, term as chair. Um, due to COVID, grant applications for presentation projects are down, but proposals for creation is way up, meaning that artists are cocooning in their studios and making optimistically new work. Hope to see a surge in this creative production in the future, but um, truth be told, there will be no return to normalcy post COVID, but future artistic survivability will be assisted by hybrid projects, these collaborations, non-traditional venues, and frankly, clever alternative forms of presentation, both in real time and space and the digital world. Over to Holly. Thank you, Peter. I'm looking forward to hearing that piece uh, with all our, our pianos. I Every time I visit the construction site, I do peek in and see them all lightly tucked away in the gallery. Um, and I can't wait to hear what uh, all those wonderful artists are gonna do with them. Um, Holly, uh, you are joining us from Scotland, but uh, I, I know you care a great deal about the arts in Nova Scotia, so I wonder what you think um, about the challenges and opportunities for artists in this region right now. Yeah, I mean, it's been very strange um, because I've taken over as music director at Symphony Nova Scotia from the other side of the planet. I'm, I'm not there. I, I, you know, so everything we're doing and, and my getting up to speed with running an organisation is, or, you know, playing a small part in running an organisation rather, is, is happening from, from a distance. But um, in terms of COVID, before I talk about the, um, the professional side of things, I'll say um, music teaching has continued throughout. So amateur playing and, and, and students playing has continued throughout. And actually, for most people, the, the transition to teaching online rather than in person, even though it's exhausting, um, it's, it's gone reasonably smoothly and has been a really essential form of income for the freelance musician community. Um, so I, th I think it's important to acknowledge how, how crucial it is to keep that going, to keep lessons going for young people, um, and uh, help uh, provide re resources for the teachers to, to be able to keep doing that. Um, it's been a lifeline. Um, many instrumental lessons work better online than they do in person because you can, you know, get two cameras going and one, one on your hand on the frets and one on the hand, just, you know. So there's all sorts of stuff that it can be really helpful. And a lot of teachers have found that younger pupils especially have advanced further in this time than, that, than they would normally expect to them to in the same period of time. And it's been especially good for uh, or helpful to students with um, who are, for instance, on the neurodiversity spectrum, um, being able to learn through the medium of screen rather than in a more confronting or, or intimate situation in person. So that's been a really interesting positive outcome. Um, live music uh, in the orchestral sector anyway has started up again. 
um, but it is, of course, radically modified. And, and like Peter, I mean, the venues, are the, it's the big issue, um, but also the very act of what we do requires intimacy and proximity to each other and breathing with each other. Um, and there's been an awful lot of press about singers and brass and wind players and the amount of air that gets expelled and whether that's a higher risk. And anyone with technique will say, no, we expel less air, not more. <laughs> um, so it's, but but it's, there's been a lot of uh, very little peer-reviewed research, but an awful lot of talk about it. And it's very difficult to legislate and set up processes when it's not really clear. Um, but more and more, um, organizations are switching to smaller outdoor performance um, performances in outdoor spaces or in larger spaces where social distancing is easier uh, and a mix of blended and fully networked events as well um, and of course with um, the Rebecca Cohn Auditorium being uh, <laughs> renovated at the moment that's been a big change for the orchestra but it's good timing really mm -hmm. um, the other thing I'm, we've, I've not heard of happening so much in Nova Scotia, but I know a lot of orchestras around the world have been staging live concerts with small distanced audiences. Then they take an hour off to clean the hall, redo the concert an hour and a half later with another small distanced audience. So there are ways to get live performance going again, but it's all pretty ruinous financially and entirely dependent on venues being able to turn around cleaning schedules quickly and respond in terms of ticketing. Uh, long term also, we have a bit of concern about whether audiences will be ready to come back to live concerts anytime soon, especially as much of the, the classical music audiences in the second half of their life. Um, and most music organizations are not equipped, literally, to make an immediate and high level switch to the digital platform. We, we just don't have that sort of equipment. So there are huge outlay costs involved, but with basically zero ticket revenue. Uh, at Nova Scotia, Symphony Nova Scotia, we've been incredibly lucky to have some really loyal and supportive donors, however, who have maintained their level of giving to help see us through this patch. And I mean, we, we owe everything to them really. Um, but I think more crucially, the challenge for us is in how the shift to socially distanced, networked and outdoor performance settings clashes with our centuries old value system in art music. Um, you know, you can't play complex polyphonic orchestral music well when you can't hear each other due to social distancing or ambient noise. You can't play a Stradivarius outside in the winter or at the height of summer so what are your options? Do you not play in those seasons? Do you not play in those spaces? Do you play on a quote unquote inferior instrument? Um, and if the latter, do you adjust your repertoire away from the canonic repertoire that we're brought up to believe demands the purity of timbre and acoustic? Or if you can't fly guest artists in who are integral to an orchestra or opera company's funding model as they draw ticket sales and private patronage, how, how will the shift to focusing purely on local artists impact upon the organization structure? Now, I'm, I'm phrasing all of those things as negative things, and actually, personally, I think they're really positive things. Yeah. But in terms of the, the culture the orchestra world has grown out of, they are huge existential questions, um, which go right down to the roots of how we learn, not just how we do our jobs, but how we learn. Um, and beyond COVID, and particularly in response to Black Lives Matter, climate change, and um, the realities of Nova Scotia being a post-colonial society, and I, I grew up similarly in one in New Zealand, art music has a really poor track record historically. Uh, it's grown out of a tradition that prioritizes the musical performances of people with privileged access in, in, in whatever way, and in particular, Eurocentric and Euro-derived music. I think the, from what I can tell, the will to, to make change is 100% genuine. And I think that's across the music community, not just in Nova Scotia, but around the world. And certainly in Nova, Symphony Nova Scotia, we take that task incredibly seriously and also joyously. To us, it's a tremendous challenge. And it's great that we now have a public who 
are getting in touch and saying, no, we really want you to do this. And, and I can then turn around and say, okay, then buy the tickets when we do, because we can't do it without you. Um, but for all music organisations, I think, in order for those changes to be enduring and have deep roots and for them to come from the voices outside of our tradition rather than being a sort of colonial um, imposition of values on, on other communities requires really significant and sort of systemic and structural change. So some huge existential questions. Um, but as I say, I think that's a good thing not a bad thing. <laughs> I, I totally agree. And I think one of the themes that's become so prominent in all of my conversations with all of you wonderful people, but really everybody I talk to is that when the mold breaks, it is a bit terrifying, but it also, we have this opportunity to build something new. And that's really where we're at now, certainly in the arts world. Um, and we've seen since the beginning of the pandemic, how vital the arts have been to people to sort of stay connected, to still feel human, whether it's from, you know, people singing from their balconies or, uh, you know, dancing in the streets uh, in Black Lives Matter protests, um, you know, uh, visual art to transform and reclaim space uh, for, from uh, to, to resist colonial imposition. Um, the arts have been so central to, to all of that um, and, and really uh, makes me appreciate all the more, you know, I'm so grateful that I've been able to dedicate my life's work to, um, to functioning in the arts and to, to training artists and to thinking about art. So um, let's turn now to the sort of second big question that I'd love to discuss with all of you wonderful people. And, and I wonder if I'll start with you again, Holly, to think about building on what you've just said and thinking about how the arts can lead the broader community in healing from the events of this year and moving forward. Um, we, we saw you weren't here, but those of us who were here uh, for, for the murders of April saw that um, one of the things that happened quite spontaneously were things that I would call artistic responses of, and, and sort of efforts at healing, right? That uh, a pilot um, flew a, a flight plan in the air that created a heart over the land that had been healed um, by the killer's rampage. Um, people set up sp spontaneous roadside memorials um, and parades of cars went by to sort of commemorate and, and, uh, and, and show respect and come together in healing. So. Um, I, I wonder if you can speak a little bit about how you see the arts leading us forward from the events of this year. Yeah, I, I was thinking about this um, when, when we posed the question earlier, and I think what the arts give us is that in an age of online soapboxes and th threads of sub, kind of passive aggressive subtweets and reactionary cancel culture, the moment someone uh, says something. Um, the arts provide a type of non-verbal and non-literal discourse that is more nuanced, more reflective, more ambiguous, which I think yeah. is a positive thing, and more private, um, all of which I think are crucial to kinder politics, deeper critical thought, and, and more measured responses to crises. Um, and the creative arts also give people a temporal and conceptual space to inhabit and to be inhabited by, to be filled up by, to whatever end they need. Um, and it's hard for me to, to imagine any equivalent, uh, apart from perhaps um, the, the sort of second reality digital space where people can create their own space online that's separate. But, that's escapism, whereas the arts is more reflection and engagement. Um, for art and music more specifically, a, a broader shift in our activity had already started happening, but needed a huge shove, and 2020 has provided it. And that's about reversing our processes in some really crucial ways. So historically, we start the premise of great art, great music, and we go from there to what space it deserves or needs, how many humans are required to do it in the best way possible. And then we look for the audience that will receive it. Um, and I think this time has highlighted that we need to start our planning processes at the point of the recipients, the broader community and our social values. And from there, make our way back to the nuts and bolts of, for them, what should be, we be doing and where. Um, and to other industries, that would probably sound so obvious. But for us, the iconicism of the works we play, the way we play them, the buildings we play them in, the clothes we wear when we play them, 
uh, has become so much an assumption of our industry's planning and funding models that the value system around it has sort of veered all the way over to that side of the road. Um, and I think there's a, a big restructuring of priorities going on and, and, and 2020 has spurred that on even more. And I think as part of that, uh, we can try to move closer to what I would think of as a more ancient model of artistic activity, which is about doing rather than watching or listening to others do, and about content rather than quality. You know, if you go back to um, criticism for, from pre sort of um, the, what we think of as the modern orchestra, it, the, a re, the equivalent of a modern review in the paper would not talk about how well people played. It would talk about what they played and what it meant and and mm -hmm. the content of the work and its significance and um, the people who were there, whereas now it's you get five stars if you didn't play any wrong notes. You know, it's yeah. it's a real shift in values and it's become much more about consumers buying a product of art. And I think the greatest gift we can give a community and a society is to say, forget that, come and make art with us, come and be part of a performance, um, come and open yourself up and, and express yourself. And it doesn't need to be virtuosic. It just needs to be connected and genuine and authentic and um, vulnerable and brave and all of these other things that, that mm. we can bring out in people. Um, so, so for us, it's not just about what we can do to help, but also how we can adapt as an art form to be more powerful, helpful in that way. Um, and if we can achieve that, then like all of the arts, I think we are a really powerful tool for healthcare. I don't know if anyone saw that video that did the rounds um, in the last couple of days of a woman with Alzheimer's who someone played her. She used to be a professional ballerina. Someone played her the music from Swan Lake and it's uh, all of a sudden this other life come, you know, comes back. Mm -hmm. um, but also for combating loneliness, mental health care, and, and in a more ordinary sense, helping people formulate and express personal and genuine feelings about everything that's happened this year. It's a, it's a, it can be a, a, a pathway for grief for instance, and reconciliation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Yes, I, I did see that, uh, the the prima ballerina, a, a Spanish ballerina, I think Marta, Marta Gonzalez, I want to say is her name. If, if, if people haven't seen it, I highly recommend this beautiful, moving um, thing to witness. Um, so, so Peter, thinking about what Holly said about how the, the music and performing arts sort of unfold through time and we feel them and experience them, and that's that's not true with with the visual arts, but I know that you have um, spoken very passionately about um, how the arts can transform space. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit about how you feel the arts can lead us forward in healing and reconciliation. Yeah, happily. And uh, I will be echoing a little bit of what Holly has, has said. Uh, so there's the three things that I, I really thought about. And the first one is just called making space and giving voice. And with physical space, you can create the pathway through it. And the temporal component is exactly how long the public viewer wants to spend with the work. And hopefully you make a compelling space for them to spend time. Um, technically, my job title says I'm a curator, but really I no longer curate in the classical sense. Um, I, I, my one line is I increasingly curate curators. So it's not about my voice it's and point of view, but I facilitate other people's projects. And I won't go into depth here, but one of my fave a couple of years ago was uh, working with Mayanne Francis uh, as the second woman and first black lieutenant governor. She had custom garments made for her office. And that was paired with um, the kind of ancestral quilt from North Preston from Chante Grant's great grandmother, and grandmother and the exhibition was about the politics of textiles and fabric in the African Nova Scotian community. And I just worked in the background to help them realize their projects. And that's very uh, satisfying. Um, and as, as Holly said, you know, we talked a lot in our group about uh, the starting point was the rampage, rekindle support for Black Lives Matter and other anti-racist strategies, and a general critique of how fine art is a product of European Western culture. And it led us to understand more deeply how cultural creativity represents powerful personal and community expression for all people, not just those in the fine arts. 
Um, second topic I'll just go through is really close to my heart, but it's also important when we speak to medical issues and social issues of uh, respect for the mature and elder folk in our midst. So many years ago, uh, Nova Scotia passed the um, status of the artist legislation, but I've been looking for a way to implement some of the goodwill of that statue and that legislation into something operable. So um, through um, Arts Nova Scotia and some other agencies, the initiative also suggests municipal legislation to accommodate living spaces and studio performing facilities, uh, production presentation clusters for mature and elder artists. Uh, many mature and elder artists live long, productive lives because of their creative engagements. Evidence shows that if we support mature and elder artists now to keep them creative, healthy, and productive, that consequently they will live longer, independent lives and stay out of expensive senior care facilities later. Uh, certainly a hot topic item during the pandemic era. So if we accord respect to mature and elder artists as cultural caretakers and teachers to the following generations and we invest in them now, um, savings, if you want to put it in that model, will be seen uh, by keeping people out of elder care facilities. But most important, it's the respect and the, the, the intergenerational teaching that they bring to the narrative. And I'm toying around with this idea of a living provincial treasure as an example of it. And one last thing is, uh, as my panelists know, I'm a bit of a geography nerd and I like to <laughs> define things by, you know, physical space as well. So a number of years ago, I kind of coined this phrase, I blurted it out at a meeting and said, well, Nova Scotia is the right size province. And everyone's looking at me like, well, what do you mean? Well, I mean, it's geopolitically and a culturally unique place. We are a small, right sized province with a modest population, but our cities and suburbs, towns and villages, rural ter territories, wildlands and parklands are relatively close to each other. Mm -hmm. Making travel and communication somewhat easy from all of our shores uh, with the proviso that high speed internet should be a citizen's right in this province at this point in time, like really. Yeah. Um, so, you know, here we are in Mi'kmaq. So we start with Mi'kmaq stories and traditions. We have rich and diverse cultural heritage that should all be given voice, not to support only the economic arguments, but to foster deeper understanding and respect of each other while becoming more resilient peoples. And even if there's not that many planes flying around, we're all within like, you know, minimum of one to eight hours away from each other in this province. So. I'm okay if the bubble continues a bit longer and we cross pollinate our stories amongst ourselves and build resilience that way. Mm. Absolutely. And I've been feeling so privileged and blessed to, to share this beautiful land and to live in, in Mi'kma'ki and uh, the, the explorations and adventures that I've had uh, during the pandemic, you know, on my bike and, and uh, just sort of going to different beaches and hikes. It's been uh, really fantastic. Um, I see we are running over. I'm sure that's my fault because I'm such a yapper. Um, but I do want to uh, invite Reza to respond to that question. I know that your work at the Prismatic Festival is really dedicated to answering the kinds of questions that we've been posing. So um, take it away. Tell us what tell us what you think. <laughs> sure, thank you. Um, I definitely think that art can play a big role in healing. And I think the the concept that I want to explore and share a little bit is starting from the process and starting from the actual creation of the art. Um, I think to get to that broader community, it needs to start within. Um, so, you know, in, in my mind, artists shape the narratives um, about the events and their experiences and their process from creation to presentation needs to be conducted in a responsible, sensitive manner with support and engagement from all, um, you know, in, from the technicians to the venues, to the presenters, to the other artists within the creation process. And one example that kind of comes to mind that I know we discussed within our, you know, discussions on our panel is in addition to creating safe spaces for artists feel welcome. It's also really important for artists from equity seeking groups um, to have identity specific spaces that belong to them. Um, and I think this is really an important starting point um, because it offers opportunities for artists from similar backgrounds and experiences to create work. And when you're surrounded by those that you can identify with, and I know my colleague Nathan Simmons um, also echoed the sentiment when we were speaking. It really helps you open up and be vulnerable when you're in that creation artistic process and to feel accepted and comfortable 
And I think this sentiment can also um, be relayed onto the audiences as well. So we, when you start with the process and creating these spaces where you can feel welcome, you can feel comfortable, that, that will articulate itself into the spaces that audience can come and view it as well. Um, and then kind of touching a little bit, both Holly and Peter, what you were both talking about, I think, you know, from a local standpoint, we need to work together and create a unified voice. And this can start from, you know, supporting the emerging artists and help with creations and the process of storytelling. Um, and that's how, you know, when we're talking about the land, we can create opportunities locally uh, to work together so that rather, you know, than competing with one another, we're a unified voice and we have a unified identity. Um, but I think one of the other the other notes that really came about in our conversations was the need to advocate for equity, not just yeah. equality. Um, and so I kind of wanted to just touch on that a little bit as well is equity of representation. So making space for marginalized and underrepresented communities, um, equity in the investment of resources as well. So not only do we want to see this on a provincial level as we come together to work together, but also shaping the identity of our province to demand equity on a national level, which probably could be a whole other conversation. So we'll leave it there. Um, but kind of just once again, going back to the topic of arts, uh, playing a big role in healing. You know, we, this year, we're, we're governed by two principles at Prismatic. It's the artists and race politics. Um, and this year, our intention in the midst of this pandemic was to sustain live performance. And we, you know, kind of scaled down our program. We had an all Atlantic roster to showcase the local talent um, that we have here and to provide those main stages for them. Um, and we had performances. We had two live performances in a socially distant, safe manner. One was, you know, at a venue, um, a restaurant that had capacity and protocols in place. And the other one was outdoors um, on the land in the space. And, you know, just the energy that was felt and from the artists and from the audiences, I know both of our artists are musicians Jamila and Owen Soundly, as soon as they got on the stage, they said, this is our first time performing in seven months to a live audience. And, and they were glowing and you could just feel, you know, that energy in the room. And, and right there, that's healing. That, that was, you know, the opinion, the embodiment of what art can do for healing. Um, you know, same thing at, we had an outdoor performance at the Grand Parade and, and, you know, people showed up, people were there because they wanted to experience it. They wanted to be a part of the community. They wanted to come to a space, you know, where they could be entertained, where they could be safe, where they could be a community together. Um, so I definitely think that it does have a huge role in healing. That's fantastic, Gracia. Um, Laurie, I think you're gonna moderate some questions for us. I think I, I think I am going to moderate some questions for you. Um, before we get to that, I just want to thank the panel so much for such an interesting discussion. I think this is such rich content, and obviously you are so passionate and engaged in it. And to hear the different perspectives has been really, really great. I was thinking um, as as you were speaking that uh, I'm from Cape Breton. And one thing that we managed to do differently this year is we did Celtic Colors online. And so some of you have maybe have attended Celtic Colors, some not, but it is um, an international festival that we have every year in October. And it is lots and lots of music. It's about, I think, 10 days. Performers all over the world come to Cape Breton. Uh, all stay at the Gala College. They all participate in musical education, teaching and learning all day, performances in the evening, and then uh, square dances late into the night. And I can't imagine how to do a square dance in a COVID, you know, in a pandemic. That is a is a close, sweaty exercise that I don't think translates to social distancing at all. But you know, every year Celtic Colors is this fantastic event where it is absolutely world-class music and the restaurants all over Cape Breton all, all participate and put absolutely their finest food up. Um, and also, you know, the leaves are all changing colors, so it's absolutely gorgeous. And so it is truly one of the richest multi-sensory experiences a person can have. And this year we did it online. And so it's inter it was really, really interesting to see like every night as much as the artists could you know, really, you know, kind of relive and, and, and reinvigorate this experience that many Cape Bretoners know so well and, and many people would be coming to for the first time. And I just like, it, it kind of brings me, I'm going somewhere with this, I promise. It brings <laughs> me to, um, Celtic Colors is something we love to do in Cape Breton because not only does it bring us visitors, 
but it allows Cape Bretoners to get together and eat and drink and dance, which is what we all love to do. Mm-hmm. So I wonder how, you know, we in, in this kind of environment that we're in now, like where things are happening online, we are moving in some spaces to be able to do live performances and things like that, depending on your jurisdiction and everything else. What do you see um, as the future of this kind of community, creating communities of local communities and also bringing larger communities together? Is there, is, are there things that we're learning here in terms of how we can use, you know, how, not use, that's not really the right word, but like how, how art and creativity and, and, you know, creating things and making things together, how that's going to not only fortify and build communities, but also breathe new life into those by, by inviting visitors. I'll start if that's okay. I, I I think everything you're saying makes a lot of sense to me. I think art, uh, you know, art is what makes us feel human, right? And and uh, you know, the success of a of a piece of art, whether it's literature or or sculpture or painting or a piece of music, is when you uh, respond to it and you feel like, yes, that's me. That mm-hmm. I feel that I recognize that this art is about me. It speaks to me, um, and so that can continue to be true even in this strange online world. Um, so if I can brag a little bit about my my fantastic students and colleagues colleagues. Um, we at the Fountain School of Performing Arts, we normally have a very robust uh, season of concerts and play productions. And of course, we can't do any of that um, at the moment. Um, but still, um, our acting students need opportunities to perform and our technical theater students and costume study students need opportunities to create work that's going to be seen on stage. So uh, the first production of our of our season uh, was a, a play called Concord Floral by a Toronto playwright uh, called Jordan Tannehill. Um, and it is a play about alienation and young people feeling disconnected and anxious um, and the, our production was entirely online each of the performers streamed in their performance from their own space I watched it at, at home um, not this beautiful study um, my, my study at home I sat you know in the dark with my iPad looking at it and it really um, it worked so well in that format that those feelings of anxiety and disconnected disconnectedness um, and alienation and yet coming together again and, and um, hearing someone else sort of articulate those feelings um, was so uh, moving for me um, and I think for other people as well. So I think there are, um, absolutely it's different, but but we can do such extraordinary things in helping people feel human and connected. Anyone else? Yeah, I'll add a little bit um, musically at the beginning and, and throughout it actually, there've been a lot of organizations who have done what they would normally do in a normal concert but but stuck a video camera on it and and tried to, to stream it and of course it's an obvious solution and it works it, it it's a, it's still a thing it's still a performance but actually i think there's a lot to be said for making what is unique to this time um and and making art that works better because it's networked and because it's distanced so you know there are pieces by john cage that are designed to be sort of happenstance things of people doing activities separately that we we happen to hear at the same time. Mm-hmm. Same Charles Ives did, did played around with that sort of stuff as well. So um, I think it's about trying not to fight against the situation we're in and, and the resources we have and instead look to leverage them and go, well, what what's possible during this time that is actually really hard in a normal live performance? Um, and where we are continuing to to connect with audiences online um don't 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 pretend that it's not online look at the camera and talk to people through the camera and and use a different format and um for me that's that's the key of it feeling genuine and feeling that there's some connection to it um the question of course the, which you kind of hinted at laurie is will there be a point at which we can all gather together in a, a town square and drink beer and, and cuddle each other. Um, <laughs> um, who knows? Who knows? But um, there, there were times in history where, where that would have been unthinkable for other reasons, social reasons. Um, there are still communities around the world today that w- without COVID can't do that because of um, social reasons, gender reasons, religious reasons. So we've been privileged to be able to perhaps, um, but I think we will – we, we, yeah, we're we a, a species that adapts and I think we will find other ways to find meaningful connection. 
if if I can add to that, I mean, as I said previously, like we're not going back to a, a normal that pre-existed us, and in many ways we can't think ourselves through these issues right now. Um, I think it's time to be somewhat brave and and bold and experiment and just kind of survival of the cleverest. And as far as I'm concerned, like all bets are off. Uh, you're better off trying something and see how it works, and then take it from there than just you know not doing it. And I don't think people are going to be faulting us for trying something that's unique to this you know cultural moment in time and try and if it doesn't work well we won't do that again but i think that there's just a real need to uh, work our way through these issues uh, obviously with as much intelligence as possible but we uh, are in uncharted waters covid something's been lost but we're also going to gain um, other new creative solutions I guess I'll chime in too then. <laughs> um, I guess the two the two positives that came to mind for me um, is for some people the accessibility um, of being able to come online and to to watch things that they maybe not would not have had access to before. Um, and then the other thing for us is just global connectivity. You know, I think there is a place and there is a need for live performance. And like I mentioned earlier, um, for us, you know, our intention is to sustain live performance, but why not find a balance between both so that you can maybe include people from around the world that might not have had the opportunity to be in that conference or see that performance. So I think, you know, taking the pros of both and finding a way to make it work together can help kind of create that sense of community in a larger, broader sense. Can I carry on one little bit, carrying on from what Ray mm -hmm. just said, do we have time? Um, and it's uh, two projects I've been involved with. So one of them through um, my street orchestra here in Scotland, the Nevis Ensemble, our motto is music for everyone everywhere. And so for during the lockdown, we made a commitment to make projects that were not about us making music, but provided a platform for people who don't have access to instruments and, and ensembles to do so. And one of those projects was um, a, a, a performance of old Lang Syne, and we recorded sort of backing tracks and produced some parts that people could download. We had over 500 um, videos sent to us from countries all over the world with people play, singing in their own languages, playing with it on their own instruments. It, I mean, it is just mind blowing. And the 500 of us would never have sung a song together, never in a million years. And then the other one, um, the first thing project that I sort of got back up and running with with real human beings during this was to go down to Leeds in the middle of England and record a new opera that was written with and by and for a very small post-industrial community in Northern England that was completely ravaged by the politics of the 1970s and 80s. All of the industry and boat built, shipbuilding and train building was taken away and along with that, disappeared culture, cultural um, buildings, local Amdram society, all because it was unviable. It was, it was not part of a conservative um, sort of uh, policy. And uh, so we made this piece and because of social distancing, we had to record the orchestra with, with all of us listening on earbuds to each other because we couldn't hear each other. Then overdub the chorus, socially distanced, two weeks later, then overdub the soloists, then overdub the community chorus and soloists. And funnily enough, I, I just saw the, the, the first full draft of video and audio just before I, I logged on to this. And it's not perfect. There's no way it could be. Um, they'd had to, for the videoing, they because they weren't allowed to stand close to each other and expel air, they had to mouth to a recording of themselves doing it in the studio. So it, it looks, you can see it's not matching up perfectly and it's not perfect. But the benefit of doing it that way was that they were able to go into a paddock and film that part of it in their actual land, in the buildings that the, that the opera they've written refers to, these, these places of really significant heritage. Um, and that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Um, so I don't know. It's interesting. I think I think there there are shortcomings, but there are also these connections. And I mean, all of us meeting, we would never have sat down and met the, the group of us were it not for this time. So 
If I can just say one other thing, it's also perfectly fine to write sad songs and sad poems during this period. Yep. That's also mm -hmm. creative expression. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Um, we're going to have a couple of questions, I think, and maybe one, <laughs> then we will uh, sign off. Uh, questions sent in ahead of time. How can these reflections on the professional community arts landscape influence the way we teach young artists? Are we genuinely preparing them for this sort of role? Uh, I guess <laughs> I'll start on the educator. Uh, so I, I think when we're training artists, we it's it's true. I mean, you know, I, I, various of you have said that 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 the old model, certainly the model I was trained in, was you know you learn to uh, think about recreating the sounds and the styles of the past. But I think now we can also think about artists' education as being about training people to be creative, to have poise, to have empathy. Right? I mean, what is it to perform except to take on the position of another human being? Right? It is the most you know an, an actor is an empath. We we learn to see the world through other people. People's eyes um, and these are such fantastic skills that artists have to have um, and to carry forward into the world so I think you know if we can think about artists training uh, in those kinds of ways I think we can get at something truly wonderful I agree certainly in the, the classical music the art music um, tradition the training is hundreds of years old in yeah. in method and in philosophy and um, I think we can do much better in preparing young people um, in music for th their own better health as practitioners, better mental health, less anxiety, um, uh, and and better community building with with their fellow artists, and not just closing themselves in little rooms and and focusing on their own technique and their own development, but actually building networks and and communities with each other. My my two youngest daughters, well, they're they're adults now, but when they were um, little little women, um, they were in Halifax Dance's recreational dance program, and it was just a weekend thing, but it wasn't for them to become prima ballerinas, but it was to explore jazz and movement, and frankly, be comfortable with their bodies as an expressive mm -hmm. tool, both socially and artistically. Done. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one last question. How do you imagine art helping to heal communities going forward into the tw into 2021 and beyond? Maybe Raisa can, can answer that. <laughs> waiting for it. Um, you know, I think it kind of touches back to all of the things that we were saying of, of how art can play a big role in healing. Like I, you know, I touched on how it starts with the process. Then it goes to engaging the audiences. It's creating those spaces where, you know, people feel comfortable, that people feel like they want to be there. Um, but also, you know, accessibility, inclusivity. There's there's so many factors that come into play. And I think, you know, if we all just identify one thing that we can do to help make a community feel, you know, welcome, I think that that can be a really strong starting process for healing. I think part of that following on from that race is, is um, so much of what you were saying earlier, I was thinking that only works when we allow multiple voices into the performance space and don't just make it a privileged space that tries to tell other people's stories. It has to, the storytellers themselves have to reflect the world around them. Um, and that that comes not just from the performer's side of things or the artist's side of things, but this is about boards and this is about um, staff members and things. It, it comes from that level of depth. Um, but also what I would love to see and what I, I hope we will see coming out of this, year, this time is an enhanced sense in audiences um, of being interested in other people's stories, being interested in stories and songs and images and clothing and language that is not their own um, because, because of the difference and because of the connectedness and because of um, history, their historic connection to it. Um, but also out of respect for it, I think art can be a mirror, but sometimes we get a bit narcissistic and just want to stare at ourselves in it. And, and it's only really a value to us as a mirror if we let, us, let it show us surprising things and challenging things and um, foreign things and other people's lives. Um, so that's what I hope the future hopes, holds. 
that is a wonderful note to end on. Thank you to the yeah. panel so much. This was such a rich mm -hmm. session and I really appreciate how much you all gave not only to the panel discussion tonight, but to the project overall. We're much, much better off for the work that you've done and we do really appreciate that. Um, I'd like to thank the panel, but I'd also like to thank the people who are making the magic happen behind the scenes here. All this technology does not work by itself. So I'd like to thank uh, Lori and Rose and Nicole for making this all happen. I'd like to thank uh, Corinna, our interpreter tonight, and all of you for coming and spending the evening with us, obviously. Um, we are going to sign off in a moment and we're gonna come back to you for one last panel discussion on November 26th. And it is called Nova Scotia's Promise Reimagined. So hopefully you'll join us for that. And once again, one last th thanks to the panel. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great night. Pleasure. Thank you. Thanks.